Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Parkinson, and I'm a scientist at the European Centre for Meteorology's Weather Forecast. And I will be giving this lecture as part of the series of lectures um, on the introduction and access to global air quality forecasting data and tools. And my colleague Chris Stewart will be giving a practical session after this lecture. Um, so you will already have seen uh, the previous two uh, sessions in the agenda, which were on air quality basics and the NASA GEOS model. This third session will be on the, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast modelling um, as part of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service or CAMPS. And the learning objectives for this, for this session are to be able to identify the different atmospheric composition and air quality relevant data sets available from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, to understand the difference between forecast analysis and reanalysis, to understand how satellite observations are used for forecasting, reanalysis, and evaluation, and to discover how to subset and visualize reanalysis and forecast outputs. So, as I said, this is session three on global air quality forecasting by the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. So I'd like to start with this slide, which gives us a sense of the, the sort of spatial scales that are involved when it comes to uh, impacts of atmospheric composition and air quality, um, and why we need to monitor it and why we why indeed we monitor it. So these um, these nine images are showing different aspects of, of atmospheric pollution in terms of local spatial scales on the left. So that's local scales less than 100 kilometers. So things like um, disasters such as uh, fires in industrial complexes, um, things like urban smog, so really at the street level, uh, but then also plume dispersion from uh, point sources such as power station, chimney stacks, uh, and other, other types of point sources. In the middle column, uh, we're looking more at the regional scale, which is horizontal spatial scale of between 100 and 1,000 kilometers. Um, and in this case, we have aspects such as uh, impacts on visibility and radiation, um, regional smog, so this is um, urban smog or the atmospheric pollution at the more national or regional or continental scale. Um, and this could also include um, things like acid rain. Um, and then finally, at the global scale in the right-hand column, we look at things like the ozone layer and the Antarctic ozone hole, which is currently go going on now in, towards the end of September of this year. Um, but then also things like climate forcing of different pollutants and biogeochemical bio cycles, including things like the carbon cycle um, and larger scale, um, global scale processes that, that affect the atmosphere. So we do this at ECMWF. And I'd just like to give a few uh, pieces of information about, about why we do this at ECMWF and, and who we are, in fact. So at ECMWF, which is the European Centre for Measuring Range Weather Forecast, our role is to address the most critical and most difficult research problems in medium range numerical weather prediction or weather forecasting. Uh, and these are problems which no one tackle, um, excuse me, no one country would be able to tackle on its own. So we're an organ organization that was created in 1975 and we consist of 34 member and cooperating states. Uh, we're based in Reading in the United Kingdom, but we have partnerships all around the world and more information can be found through our website, which is given us by the link there. Um, ECMWF contributes to the Copernicus program through a couple of different services. Um, so Copernicus is the European Union's operational Earth observation and monitoring program. Um, and what it does is to launch some satellites, which are called the Sentinels, and they're shown in, in silhouette on the left there. And data from these satellites, which measure all different aspects of the Earth system, including the land surface, the marine environment, as well as the atmosphere. The, these observations provide, are fed into um, value-added services, which are listed in the right. So there are six of these services from atmosphere, climate, land, marine, emergency, and security. And the two that are, are surrounded by solid line uh, boxes there, the atmosphere and climate services, are both implemented and operated by ECMWF. And we also contribute data and 
part of the service to the emergency management service related to flood forecasting and, and fire danger forecasting. And one of the bottom lines for the Copernicus program is that these services are user driven and all the data is free and unrestricted and available to anybody that wants to use it. So in the atmosphere monitoring service, we um, have a portfolio which covers a, a fairly wide range of um, information products related to all aspects of, of atmospheric composition. These include uh, surface fluxes and emissions inventories due to um, operational forecasts at the, the global but also the regional scale for Europe, um, looking at air quality and the ozone layer. And we also have various applications in terms of solar radiation and climate radiation reporting. Um, and this is all provided by one consistent system. Um, and the whole uh, thing of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, or the whole operation of it, is based on uh, a large European consortium, uh, including 196 different entities across Europe. And more information can be found on our website, and the link is given at the top of the slide. So one question uh, we have to raise is, is why do we need something like CAMS? Why do we need a service which takes in satellite data and provides then um, additional information? Um, and this is an example showing nitrogen dioxide tropospheric columns observed by the Copernicus Sentinel-5P or Tropomi um, satellite. Um, and this is an example from October 2018, and we're, we're looking at in, in the blues, greens, and reds, the um, NO2 values. But in black, we have, we have regions where there are no observations. This could be due to cloud contamination and the, the satellite not being able to see the surface, um, but it could also be due to some artifacts in, in the in the observation and in the retrieval and, and the extracting the information on NO2 in, in those particular pixels. And this is a scene that's looking over Eastern Europe. So these observations are essential and, and really important. Uh, however, to directly make use of them, it can be quite limited and can be quite challenging. Um, as I mentioned, these black, these black areas in the um, image are showing gaps in space and time. That the observed quantities may not be directly relevant to, to our application or to how we want to use them. So, for example, this is a vertical integrated tropospheric column, but it does not necessarily directly relate to the, the surface concentration. Um, plus, also, this is only one scene from one instrument, um, and there can be complex and numerous um, data available and getting into the terabytes of data. So what CAMS does is to blend these observations, not just from satellites, but also from non-satellites, uh, with a model to provide a consistent three-dimensional state. And um, by doing this, we can then initialize forecasts and predict um, atmospheric composition and air quality a few days ahead. But we also then run reanalyses, uh, which cover the past years or decades uh, with a consistent framework. And more information will be given on these, uh, the differences between these as, as the lecture goes on. So in CAMS, we have an information flow that looks in simple terms, something like this. So on the left, we have Earth observation from satellites. Currently, this is about 75 different instruments, but also we use in situ from regulatory or research uh, measurement networks to to provide additional information in terms of validation and um, additional constraints on the system. This data feeds into, um, first of all, our main operational data assimilation and modeling system. This is the ECMWF integrated forecasting system. And this, we operate at about 40 kilometer spatial resolution operationally, and then for our reanalysis at 80 kilometers. Um, these global forecasts are then used to provide the boundary conditions for a nine-member ensemble of regional air quality models um, over the European domain. Um, and then information from both of the, the global and regional um, forecasting systems are used in, in various applications. So there are applications um, for policy-related products, uh, for, re 
for regional air quality um, in different cities across Europe. Our data is also used by various air quality apps such as windy.com, breezometer and plume labs. And our air quality forecasts are also featured regularly um, every day on, on Euronews for Europe, but also CNN International. So what, what does this mean in practice? So we have a data assimilation system. We'll talk a bit, a bit about data assimilation shortly. Um, and as I mentioned, this is built on the ECMWF integrating forecast, integrated forecasting system. So in the middle here, we have uh, various control variables, or what we call control variables, and these are related to different uh, atmospheric pollutants. So the chemistry, uh, the reactive gas species, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and formaldehyde. Um, then also aerosols, which uh, speciated based on, um, on their emission type. Um, but then also we include greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane. And of course, this is a, a weather prediction system originally, so it includes all the meteorological variables as well. So to, to get at the chemistry, we include um, various uh, different types of models and solvers for the chemistry. So these solvers solve the, the, the chemical equations um, to give us then the atmospheric pollutants. Um, currently, we're, we're using something uh, called TM5, which includes 57 chemical species and 131 chemical reactions. And this includes uh, photolysis, so reaction with solar radiation, and also uh, removal processes of some of these pollutants through dry and wet deposition. Um, and then for the aerosol model, we have uh, 14 bins. Well, that, this is basically dividing up the aerosol types by the species, whether it is desert dust, sea salt, organic matter, black carbon sulfate, nitrate, or ammonium. And then the size of the particles is also taken into account. Um, and then greenhouse gas fields, as I mentioned. So we initialize these, uh, the composition forecast using additional information, such as emissions. So GFAS here, I'll come to shortly, but is uh, providing daily um, global wildfire emission estimates, but also fluxes from anthropogenic sources as well as natural sources. Uh, we add in observations. To do this, we include all the uh, information of how we translate the observation into the model space, how we uh, correct for biases between the model and the observation, and also take into account um, statistics on the background areas in the model, because this is a model and of course they are completely perfect. Um, and then in terms of the output, our aerosols and ozone can, are interactive with the radiation. This means this is the atmospheric radiation, and so this is basically the transmission of uh, light from the sun down through the atmosphere to the surface, and then the outward um, radiation of the outward emission, excuse me, of thermal radiation. Um, and the aerosols and gases in the atmosphere interact with this radiation and can affect then uh, the weather uh, forecast through, through changes in, in surface temperatures and, and the winds. Um, and in this case, the aerosols and ozone are interactive with that radiation and so they can make adjustments to the, the temperature in the model and also the, then the wind and the distribution of the, the pollutants in, in, in the atmosphere. Um, we also have chemical coupling between the aerosols and the reactive um, reactive gases. So, for example, nitrogen dioxide can, is a precursor for nitrate and ammonium aerosol, and this this information feeds into the aerosol, so we improve our our modelling of the aerosol as well as the chemistry. Um, and one future development, which I'm not really going to talk about, is the development of an inversion capability, and this is. Uh, a system which will be able to take in these observations and then improve our estimates of the emissions from the surface by by taking into account uh, the observed uh, the observed excuse me the observations of the uh, the relevant uh, parameters and chemical species in the atmosphere. Um, so we have a number of configurations. Um, and more information is given in the references here. 
Um, in terms of taking in observations, we have a, an information flow which is which is important for being able to make sure that we make the best use of the available observations and that they actually provide uh, a positive impact in improving the accuracy of, of the forecast that we provide. So typically from a, a satellite instrument, you get um, different levels of data which are denoted here. So level one B data is typically what the, uh, the satellite is measuring. And this is some form of electromagnetic radiation, either thermal infrared or ultraviolet or visible um, light coming from the atmosphere or reflected back from the atmosphere. Um, this level 1b data goes through uh, a process called retrieval, which is retrieving the amounts of the different gases in the atmosphere, which contribute to what is observed in terms of that, that thermal infrared or UV visible. Um, measurements. And this then provides us with something called level two data. So this is retrieved parameters, and that could be something like ozone or nitrogen dioxide or aerosol or a greenhouse gas. We feed this information into our uh, analysis and monitoring tools, which are as were, were, were shown in the previous slide. And by doing this, we can then look at statistics over a period of time to see are there any drift? How, how close are the excuse me? How close are the um, observations to the, the model? And if, uh, if, any, if there are any biases between them, whether those are changing over time. And this is useful information because we can feed that back to the retrieval teams to point out if there might be some um, issues with the retrieval process or if something is missing or not quite correct. So we can do this iteratively until we have a, a very reliable uh, satellite product and one that also provides meaningful information for being able to predict um, how atmospheric composition is changing. When we have this good data, we've been through this process of, of monitoring and feedback, um, we can then feed the, feed the observations into our simulation system. Um, and ultimately lead to including in observed information, this new observed information into our analyses and then forecasts. Um, and when we've done that, we have downstream services and users, all of which are hopefully very happy with, with what we're providing. So in more practical terms, uh, this, this is what that looks like. So we have, we're requiring data from, from the internet and from different service providers. Um, either from the space agencies directly or through um, through other servers, such as through the, the World, Meteorolog World Meteorological Organization. So this goes through some, so every day we're going through this acquisition process. Um, and then we're ingesting that data and putting it into a format that we can then feed directly into our model through the, the high performance computing that, that we run at ECMWF. Um, and then this is what provides us with the, the capability to do the monitoring of the observations and to identify any biases or any caveats with the observations, which we can then iteratively um, feed back to data providers. Okay, so this is this has all been a preamble on the system that we're running to, to lead to the point to, to give you more information on what what observations we're actually using and what then some actual applications of our products are in terms of the forecast and analysis and reanalysis. So this slide is showing um, an overview of the different satellite instruments that we're using currently for atmospheric composition applications. So the table here is showing a list of um, species in the atmosphere um, from reactive gases, ozone, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, also aerosol, and then greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide and methane. And the very bottom row is then showing the observations that we use to estimate wildfire emissions. So if we, so the, in this table, each of the instruments that is uh, colored red is showing the data that is currently actively assimilated in CAM and is actually providing information directly into our forecast system. 
the ones in bold but in black are show uh, instruments which we are currently implementing in our system and which are being tested and going through this monitoring process of understanding if there are biases between the observations and the models and whether those biases are changing over time. Um, and then the, the other ones, um, just in the, the plain font, um, are showing instruments which are under development and which are planned for the future at, at some point. So you can see we've got quite a wide range of instruments and um, species which are being assimilated. Um, and this is, this is how we uh, provide the service that we provide. And then this is a rather complicated uh, slide that shows the uptake of observations um, within ECMWF and particularly those related to, to atmospheric composition. So this um, bar chart on the left goes from 1996 up, just up to 2018 and shows this very year on year almost increase in the uptake of observations and their assimilation at, at ECMWF. So we see we go from um, or so in the, through the mid 90s into the early 2000s. And then that has now increased uh, about eightfold to about 80 or 90 um, data products, which we actively assimilate every day. Um, and then the table on the right, I don't expect you to read, but it's just giving you then a list of those instruments, just to give you a sense of the number of instruments and the number of different satellite platforms and space agencies that we work with to, to use their data and more information is provided in the, the link at the bottom of the slide. So I mentioned earlier uh, this uh, process of data assimilation, um, and this means, this provides us with a means of combining the information of a, a huge number of observations with our global model. Um, and we, to do that, we need to take into account the background statistics of the model and of the observations, um, and so this data simulation process is the provides us with the means for bringing together the observations and the model to provide um, something which is a combination of both and which more accurately reflects the, the true state of the atmosphere. Um, and we do this by minimizing a parameter called a cost function, which is denoted by the letter J, um, and is given by this rather complicated at first sight looking um, equation. But essentially what it's doing is a least squares fit combining the information from the model background, which is denoted by a B, and then um, by the observations, which are denoted by um, an O and, or an R. Um, and so if we just take note of the, the, uh, the red words and arrows, this is kind of giving a sense of indicating of, of where, where these things lie. So, if we look at the equation on the bottom, our analysis, which is essentially our starting point for the forecast, is a combination of taking the previous forecast and then adding some change to it, which combines uh, the difference between the observation, Y, and the, the background forecast, which is XB. And to be able to do this, they need to be um, in the same uh, space, and we do this through an observation operator. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. But what the, the graphic on the left is showing is a, a sort of visual representation of how data simulation works. So we have our previous forecast, which is shown by this light blue um, arrow on, on, the, on the graph. Um, and then we have these observations that come in at various points, which are shown by a green star. And we can see there's some deviation uh, of what is observed to what our previous forecast thought the, the atmospheric state would be. So we go through this process of minimizing this cost function to determine our analysis. And then the analysis, which is, which is a, a somewhere between the previous forecast and the observations, um, is then used to start a new forecast, which is essentially corrected by the observation. And then we see we have a more realistic trajectory of that um, arrow compared to the previous day's forecast. So another way to, to look at data simulation is um, how we um, get the, the observation to be comparable with the model state. And we do this through um, this parameter called an observation operator, 
which essentially converts the model parameter or the model forecast uh, comparison against the observation in the same space that the observation was made. So that takes into account the location of the observation, the time of day, any of the, the physics of the, the measurement and the, the instrument that's used to make the measurement. Um, and in its simplest form, this would just be a, a means of interpolating from the model grid to the observation location. For example, if we were using just in situ observation, but for satellite observation, as I say, we also need to take into account some of the physics of the measurement so that we're comparing two parameters which are which are in the same which are in the same space. So we're comparing like with like rather than slightly different um, parameters. So this slide is showing um, then how how these observations look like in our in our assimilation system. So these uh, these maps are showing um, the the observations available for just one day for different chemical species. So we're looking at carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen dioxide in the troposphere, formaldehyde, and sulfur dioxide. Um, and the different colours of the on, on each map is indicating a, a different observation, and those observations are, are labelled in the boxes to the side of each map. Um, and some of these data are actively assimilated and some of them are monitored and some are just monitored and that's denoted by the, the shading of the of the um, observation in the um, in the box. Um, and what this shows is that for, for ozone, NO2, HCHO and SO2, these are observations from ultraviolet and visible uh, parts of the, the spectrum. Uh, and what that means is that these observations are only possible when uh, there is sunlight uh, shining on, on the atmosphere. And so this is why we only see this fairly small area of the, of the Earth um, actually covered by, the, by where, where the observations are from. Carbon monoxide, however, is measured by thermal infrared. Those measurements are possible to make during the day and during the night, and therefore with, with just over, over one day, we get a full global coverage with, with the instruments that are shown in this, um, this um, slide. Um, and one thing, one thing that's worth noting is that m all of these satellite observations are essentially providing some kind of integrated total column amount. So this is uh, an estimate of how much of that particular trace gas or aerosol is in the atmosphere from the surface up to the top of the atmosphere. However, our model is three-dimensional. And so one of the advantages of combining this, these observations with the model in CAM is that we can then redistribute the observations to give us a three-dimensional picture of the atmosphere. So this is an example looking at carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is, is a very useful tracer. It's a product of um, incomplete combustion. And therefore, it's a very good indicator of atmospheric pollution from wildfires and industrial processes. Um, carbon monoxide also has a photochemical lifetime in the atmosphere of about a, of a couple of weeks to a month. And so it really gives us a good indication of where, the, where pollution is and where it could be transported to over, over the next few days. So the, the first chart here is showing um, carbon monoxide observations from the measurements of pollution in the troposphere instrument, which is on the NASA um, EOS Terra satellite. And we see the kind of coverage that, that we have from MOPIT. So this is, MOPIT is an interesting instrument because it was launched already in, at the end of 1999, and it's still functioning very, very well uh, to this day. And was really a, a groundbreaker in how we understand atmospheric pollution from space. This next image is showing carbon monoxide on the same day, but from an, an instrument called IASI, which is a European instrument, um, which was launched uh, a few years after, after the Terra satellite. And we see we, we start to get increased uh, coverage uh, from the way that the observations are made. Um, and then by combining them with the model, we can get, we can get uh, a map that fills in the gaps in the observation and um, has a, has a combined picture of, of what carbon monoxide looks like at the global scale. 
And then also because the model is three dimensional, we can redistribute that information in the vertical. So we can really look at how carbon monoxide looks, not just in terms of a two dimensional map, but also in terms of its vertical extent and distribution. Um, one of the challenges of, of using uh, satellite observations is how many observations are available and how we um, how we merge them into into our system. So this is a, a case looking at the Antarctic ozone hole in October 2019, and what it's doing is comparing uh, the CAMS forecast at the top left, and then three uh, different instruments of uh, three different instruments which measure in the, the UV visible, and those are the tropomi, GOM2, and OMI instruments. So these have all been launched at different times. Tropomi is the most recent. Um, and we, what, we, what we see is between the different satellite instruments is a change in um, how, how many observations they are able to make over the course of a day. So we can see with, with the OMI instrument there, it's, it's fairly limited. With GOM2, it's a bit more. And then with Tropomi, you're almost getting in the observation something that, that resembles what the model is showing. Um, but this, these, these four images give you a sense of how the, the same information looks from four different, four different ways of looking at it. So, of course, in CAMS, that, that map is showing the data that is assimilated from GOM2 and OMI into the, the CAMS forecast system. Uh, so, okay, so this, this map here is showing the... Um, the observations at their native spatial resolution. So we see a lot of features along this orbit swath um, going from northern Europe down to the, the southern ocean um, and the eastern part of or the western part of the Indian Ocean. Um, if we resample the um, observations at the spatial resolution of the CAMS forecast system, so by default it is um, for atmospheric composition, this is 40 kilometers. We see um, we see that we, we we have a similar picture that some, most of the main features are still there um, when we we resample at the um, or when we do the super orbiting at the uh, the coarser resolution in the model. Um, we also run the model at coarser resolution still in some cases, um, and this is what the observations would look like if they were super orbed at this um, spatial scale of 120 kilometers or rather than 40 kilometers. Um, and this is a, another example of uh, super robbing where we can look at um, nitrogen dioxide from different uh, satellite instruments and, and different um, retrieval proce processes. Um, and this is just to show again, with Tropomi we get really uh, highly detailed spatial coverage um, compared to the, what was previously available from, from satellite observations in, with the GOM2 instruments um, and also OMI. This is a case over North America in uh, November 2017. Um, and then if we go through this super robbing process, it's just to show that, that the, the amount of information that Tropomi brings to CAM when we look at it at the different, at, when it's been through this process of super um to the different model resolutions. So this is at the, the CAMS operational resolution of about 40 kilometers. Um, then even at this um, much coarser spatial resolution, which is about 120 kilometers, if you remember from the previous slide, that, that we have much, much better coverage than, than what was previously available from satellite observation. So, I mentioned uh, a few slides ago that Moppet was a, a game changer in how we understood atmospheric pollution from space. Uh, Tropomi has been another one of these um, step changes in our understanding of our atmospheric pollution using satellites, just purely and simply for the coverage that it, it provides. Um, and I'd mentioned or I alluded to very, uh, right at the beginning this um, observation process and feeding information back to the um, the uh, data providers through monitoring of, of the observations. And this slide is just a further illustration of that. So 
uh, we can, by feeding the observations into our system, we can look at things like um, different, we can look at things like how the observations uh, depart or, or are different from our, our background forecast. Um, so the, the, the two panels on the left are showing um, this observation minus model first guess departure over a period of um, a couple of months or a, a period of um, a, a couple of weeks rather in 2021. And we start to get a sense of where the differences are between the observations and the, and the background model. And then also by looking at uh, these Hofmuller style plots at the bottom left, we get a sense over, over time whether those um, biases or those departures are, are changing. And the, the charts on the right are also showing something very similar. So by looking at a time series of different monitoring statistics, and I'm not going to go through what they are right now, but this is just to give you a sense that we can, we can see as a function of time how these different statistics change. So are, are the, is the observation behaving in a consistent manner over a period of time? And then when, by understanding this, we can, we can have some confidence in assimilating it into our system, but also any departures and deviations we can feed back to the data providers um, so that they could look at improving their, their, their data that they provide. Okay, so that that summarize, that comes to an end of uh, what I wanted to talk about in terms of the system and in terms of how we ingest observations and how we make use of satellite observations in CAM. Um, I'm also I'm going to now talk about some of the input, other inputs and data products that we have. Um, and show some examples of, of what they look like uh, for different applications. So one of the one of the most important things uh, we need for for modeling atmospheric composition are the surface inputs in terms of emissions and fluxes uh, from different processes at the surface. So um, in this case, we're looking at um, an example of emissions from shipping, um, and so this is a, a data set that was. Um, developed under CAMS and is, is also one of part of our data portfolio. And what it's showing is at the European domain and then at the global domain, emissions of carbon dioxide from shipping. Um, and so we see all the ship tracks for different regions of the world, across the different oceans, across different seas. Um, and this is just one um, element that then feeds into the emissions that we need to be able to correctly model atmospheric composition. Um, so our emissions inventories uh, are all available through our, our atmosphere data store. Um, and then this is, these are just a, a couple of examples that show um, emissions of sulfur dioxide from different regions in Asia, so China, India, Southeast Asia. And so it's just to give you a sense of so there's a number of different emissions inventories and this gives a sense of where the, the, the current CAMS emissions lie relative to those in terms of their trend over, over the, last, um, the last couple of decades. Um, so in all of these charts, there is a, a black line with red, with red circles, which is the, the CAMS emissions inventory. And we can see that it lies somewhere in the middle of other emissions inventories that have been developed over the last uh, 30 or so years. So we provide these emissions as, as an inventory, which means that they're, they're fairly static in time, but they have these, the, these trends, uh, monthly trends and annual trends, but they don't really change um, very quickly um, over the course of days. They, they, they're changing very slowly over the course of a, a season or, or over several years. Um, but one of the key elements of emissions for, for atmospheric pollution, atmospheric composition, are fire emissions. Um, and so these have a lot more spatial variability and temporal variability. And so we need to be able to estimate them um, in near real time. And we do this using um, our system, which is called the Global Fire Assimilation System, which makes use of satellite observations of this parameter called fire radiative power. Um, so there are a number of satellites which are providing observations of fire radiative power. Currently, we are using two NASA MODIS instruments, 
but we're also testing and implementing um, some of the satellites um, to be able to make use of, of that information and to improve the, the product that we have. Um, so these DFAS emissions are provided with the global coverage at about 10 kilometer spatial resolution. We provide information with hourly output, which runs about seven hours behind near real time, so that when we initialize new forecasts, we really have the most up-to-date information that, that's available on the, the distribution and the, the, the scale of fires as they're burning worldwide. Um, and then we estimate emissions of, of aerosols and gases uh, using factors which are dependent on the vegetation type. Um, and we also provide injection heights, which gives you a sense of where of the, the, the power of the fire and where most of the, the gas or aerosol is being put into the atmosphere as, as a function of the, the size of the fire. This animation um, runs for a couple of minutes and it's showing us the, the daily changes in global fire emissions throughout the whole of um, 2020. Um, so we see in, in January, February and March, a lot of fires in the northern tropics, so over northern parts of South America, Central America, and also northern tropical Africa. Um, and then as we go through into the spring um, and then to the summer, we see how that distribution changes. So we see the shift from northern tropical Africa to southern tropical Africa. Um, we see more fires in, in Mexico, more northern parts of South Central America. Um, and then as we go into June, particularly in 2020, we saw the emergence of these fires within the Arctic Circle, within uh, Siberia and Eastern Russia. And as we go through the summer and as we reach um, September, we start to see fires developing in California and in uh, the Pacific Northwest in the US and these really flared up in, in September. And then it runs through to the end of the year where we start to see the, the fires in, in central parts of South America and the Amazon. Um, and, and then through to the end of the year. Um, and what this really shows is just how, how, much variability, how much fire there is worldwide day by day and how much that changes in terms of its distribution, particular location um, throughout the year. So um, I just want to show an example of, of what these emissions then look like in terms of their, their daily totals and uh, annual totals. So this chart is showing uh, a time series of the daily total estimated carbon emissions from fires worldwide um, from the 1st of January through to the end of December. So the red line is showing the data for 2020 and the black line is showing an average of the previous year's data. So our data set GFAS goes back to 2003. Um, and then we see that generally we, there, there was perhaps below average activity through at the global scale throughout much of the year, but of course it changes um, regionally. Uh, and then this bar chart is showing the annual total estimated carbon emissions from global wildfires to show that from 2003 through to 2020, how, how the, uh, the fire activity changes year on year. And then I have an a couple of examples of um, the whole CAMS process, if you like, in action. So this is a slide showing um, fire emissions and uh, smoke transport in August of 2017. So the charts on the right are showing the, the daily total estimated carbon emissions from Siberia and Canada. Um, and again, so the red bars are the, the emissions from that year, 2017, and the gray bars are the mean emission from the previous years of 2017. Um, and we see this, um, these uh, peaks in the, the fire emissions, and, and we see then the resulting smoke transport around the Northern Hemisphere um, as a result. And this, this case was kind of exceptional because we saw smoke from fires in British Columbia transported high into the Arctic Ocean and, and to the North Pole. Um, and then another similar case, this is looking at August of 2018. So these are fires in, in North America. Um, and what I'm showing here is in the line, in the, excuse me, the charts around the, the edge of this animation. 
is showing some sense of the evaluation of the CAM forecast relative to independent observations which are made by um, Aeronet sites. So Aeronet is a, a network of instruments which measure the amount of aerosol in the atmosphere, and this is comparing um, the parameter of organic matter aerosol optical depth, which is a proxy for smoke, um, compared then against the, these observations. And what we see is as this smoke was transported from the western parts of North America across the continent, then across the Atlantic, that at these measurement sites along the path of the, the smoke transport, that we see a, a good agreement in the forecast with then these independent observations. Another example uh, for our regional forecast has been to look at European air quality. Um, and we provide various tools for, for looking at the, uh, the, the source allocation and the chemical speciation of of some uh, particulate matter uh, for the European countries. This comes about as a result of having a nine member um, ensemble of air quality forecast models. Uh, more information on this tool can be found on, through the link given below. And this was a case looking at um, uh, aerosol transport in a cold front um, in Northern France um, in the spring of uh, 2020. Um, and this resulted in uh, this, uh, this, trans this very narrow band of uh, sulfate aerosol crossing northern France and being noticed by, by people on the ground through the smell. I'm going to skip that one and talk about the analysis. Uh, so I mentioned right at the beginning that we also have a, a reanalysis product. A reanalysis is uh, a combination of observations and models to create historical um, conditions, climate conditions through things like the ERA-5 and the MERA reanalysis, for example. Um, but in CAMS, we also provide uh, reanalysis of global atmospheric composition. Um, all the data is available through our atmosphere data store, and the link is given above. And um, there's some examples are given in this page, and I'll give some more in the, the next couple of slides. Um, so, Basically, um, the re our reanalysis covers the period of 2003 to 2020, and it all uses a consistent uh, model setup for that whole period. Uh, and then we provide information on aerosols, chemical pollutants, as well, and also greenhouse gases. And this reanalysis runs at a spatial resolution of about 80 kilometers. And a paper documenting the reanalysis and the and the technical aspects of it are given in, in this paper by my colleague. Um, anti Innis from 2019. Um, and the chart on the right is showing uh, a score in, in ozone. So this is the forecast, the predictability, if you like, of ozone um, in, at the, in, in the Southern Hemisphere over Antarctica at the Neumeier Station. Um, and so basically it's showing um, how the, the reanalysis is compared from 2003 up till well, about 2017 with the um, with the real time operational forecast. So we can see that every every so often we go through this process of upgrading and improving the model cycle and use operationally, and that leads to then to jumps and changes in the time series over time. But what the reanalysis does, it, it smooths out all of those gaps because the model system doesn't change from year to year. Um, and some applications of the reanalysis uh, are shown here. So this, this particular one is looking at anomalies of carbon monoxide on the top panel and, and aerosol optical depth on the bottom panel in relation to the, the huge bushfires which burned in southeastern Australia in January 2020. And what this shows is that above, well above average or well above the climatological average values of carbon monoxide and AOD over the Pacific between Australia and South America in relation to uh, the emissions from those fires. Um, and this is uh, giving a sense then also of, uh, on the left, uh, an evaluation of, of aerosol optical depth against um, the different versions of our, of our re the reanalyses that we produced in CAM. 
and then the right and evaluation of uh, carbon monoxide total column um, at two uh, sites, one in um, North America and one in Australia over that period of the, the, the reanalysis. Um, and another application uh, and something which is very relevant right now is uh, monitoring of the Antarctic ozone hole. Um, and so with our reanalysis, we're able to really compare current states of the ozone hole with what's happened in previous years or over the same period of time. Um, so this, this is showing a chart of the total ozone distribution, very clearly showing the hole with this strong polar vortex on the 15th of September of this year. And then the two line charts on the right are showing that the ozone hole area and the ozone hole column minimum as a function of time from the start of the season through to the end of the season to show where the current situation is relative to what we saw last year and then in all the previous years. I'm going to skip this. Um, and one thing we can one thing we can also do with not just the CAMS reanalysis, but with the ERA-5 reanalysis, which goes back even further in time to, to 1979, the start of the satellite era, um, we can now we now have a, a means of comparing the ozone hole size and depth um, for this whole 42-year period, which is shown in, in the slide here. Um, it's worth noting that all of this uh, work is is um, is useful, but it's only as useful if it's providing usable information that's improving on on the information that that would be available anyhow. Um, we go through a process of documentation and quality control every quarter, um, and all the reports for the validation of our system are available from our website through the link given on this slide here. Um, this image is just to give you a sense of the range of measurement networks and measurement types which are used for evaluation at the global scale using in situ, ground-based remote sensing, uh, aircraft, surface measurements, and, and also satellite observations for, for understanding um, how well our forecasts compare with, um, with other observations. Um, and then this table, again, it's rather complicated, but it gives you a sense of the species that, that are included in the CAMS portfolio, their, their vertical range, what satellites are assimilated, and then what instruments and, and observations are available for um, validation and evaluation. And these are these are all routinely used for our quarterly uh, validation of the, the CAMS data. Um, in terms of data access, my colleague Chris is going to, to show you the practical of how to access data and how to do some basic um, uh, plotting and manipulation of the data. But all our data, as I said at the beginning, is, is completely free of charge and, and open access and is mostly available now from the atmosphere data store. Um, so the idea of the atmosphere data store is that all the data is available for download from one place. Um, and it can be in, it can be accessed either interactively or with programmatic access through API uh, and also using Python or, or other um, other means of access. Um, and then all the data formats are supposed to be standardized and harmonized um, and everything runs in the cloud so it, it should be more efficient in terms of accessing the data. Um, just to give you a sense of, of some numbers, so uh, as of June of 2021, um, with just one year of operation of the, of the ADS, uh, we had 11 published data sets with two more being close to being ready and ultimately all of the CAMS data will be available through this um, ADS. Um, and then just a, a sense of the, the, the scale of the data in terms of um, the storage in terms of terabytes um, and what would be needed to, to you know, keep all of this data um, on a local machine if, if you were to, to use all this data on your, on your own. And actually, Brock, I would maybe skip this slide if, if possible. 
but not, yeah, I don't think it's necessary. So if we can flip, skip this one, that would be helpful. Thanks. Um, okay, and then just a quick uh, look at what the atmosphere data store looks like. Um, so the website is given here through this link, and you get to a page that looks something like the image uh, shown. Um, and then to access the data, you just need to register once, and then you can log in. It's a simple registration. Um, when you're inside the data store, you can then search the catalog. So this, you can find all the data sets that are currently published through a page that looks like this. And then when you've chosen the, the, the data you want to use, you then just basically go through check, check boxes to, to tick the parameters that you want, and, uh, which level, which date range that you want data for. Um, and then you can download this data as net CDF files and you can use the data. This is just an example using Panapply to look at PM 2.5 um, forecast, uh, which of course that you can use any program or application that you want to, to, to access and look at what the data actually shows. Welcome to this practical part of the training. In this part, we're going to look at how to access data from CAMS and how to process that data. And we're going to do that through Jupyter Notebooks. So there is actually a Jupyter Notebook tutorial that I will go through. Um, but before I do so, I'd just like to introduce myself. So my name is Chris Stewart and I work at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts um, and my job title is Copernicus Training and Knowledge Transfer Officer. So I coordinate the training activities for the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service and also the Copernicus Climate Change Service. So what I'd like to do now is to go through um, to show you practically how you can uh, access data uh, on air quality from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service and how you can view that data um, using, um, using Python. And we're going to access the data programmatically using the API, but I'm also going to show you how you can download it using the website. So the first thing is to show you how you can access this Jupyter Notebook tutorial. So this tutorial is available on a GitHub. And it's a GitHub, um, a GitHub repository for ECMWF projects, Copernicus training. And you see the link here in the address bar. And in this GitHub repository, you find a lot of Jupyter notebook material. This is likely, this, the structure of this GitHub repository is likely to change, but the content will be the same. So you'll still be able to access the same content, even if the structure, the order of the notebooks may vary a little bit. And what you'll find is um, you'll find that the, the Jupyter notebook is, is in this repository, but also links to run this Jupyter notebook in a, a container environment. So this enables you to run the tutorial without actually having to install anything. So if you want to run this on your own system, you would have to install Jupyter, Python, and various different libraries. But if you if you click on if you click on a link here to launch the tutorial in Binder, you can launch it in uh, in a container where everything is installed and set up for you, and you and you really don't need to uh, install anything. So the tutorial is um, this one here. So 2021-09 CAMS air quality data access. And you will find this um, here. So this is the actual Jupyter notebook tutorial. Um, but as I said, you can run it using, um, using Binder. So I'll just show you how that works if I open it in a new window. Um, so here it launches a, it, it, uh, an instance in a, in a Docker container where everything is installed and it takes some time to, to prepare the environment. But then once it's done, you will uh, see 
the notebook um, and you will be able to run the various different code blocks um, quite simply. If you just want to see a rendered version of the tutorial without actually running the tutorial, you can click on the link here. In the meantime, the tutorial, I think, has opened up um, in the container. So here you can actually, here you can see it. And what you would, okay, I don't know why there's a problem here. Okay. And here you can, you can run the various different code blocks. If you select the, if, so this, you can see that in gray, you see the, the blocks where there's code in Python. And these blocks are separated by text in Markdown. So these text and images uh, explain the background uh, with the instructions of what we're going to do. And these blocks in gray uh, are the actual code blocks that you need to run. And you can run them by selecting the, um, the play icon here. OK, so we, when you run, when you click on, on play, then you end up running these code blocks. You have to click inside the code block then you click on play and it will run these blocks. OK, so you can do this. You can run the tutorial in your own time. Um, if you just if you don't want to run the tutorial and you just want to see how it looks, you can click on this link here, the a rendered version here, and this will open it, uh, open a, um, a web page where you can see the tutorial. You can also download it. Um, and here you, you don't actually run, you can't run any of the code blocks, but you can just see how the tutorial looks. So what I'd like to do now is to start going through the tutorial, um, which I already have opened. I think I have it um, here. And what this tutorial will do is, it's broken into three parts. The first part is just to prepare your environment. And what you need to do um, to prepare your environment, if you're running the notebook in, in, um, in Binder, so um, in the container, then you don't need to install anything. But what you do have to do is you have to register with the Atmosphere data store of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. And you need to obtain an API key so an application programming interface key that enables you to uh, to download the data programmatically. So that's the first part. Then the second part is uh, a part where we're going to access data from the CAMS Global Atmospheric Composition Forecasts. Uh, so we're going to look at a forecast um, of um, organic matter aerosol optical depth for the first few, few days of August. And then the last part is, um, uh, is, is how to access the CAMS global reanalysis data. And we're going to create a figure from, of carbon monoxide um, from this data. So if we now go to the first part, so um, for this, I'm going to start off, I'm gonna to go to the, the, the atmosphere data store of CAMS. So first we go to the, if we go to the, um, the homepage of, of CAMS. So let me just go to the homepage. So this is the, this is the, the, the homepage of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. Um, and in this homepage, you'll see a link to data. So if we select this link, then um, here you see the various different uh, places where you can access data. So there's a data catalog um, and, this, and the atmosphere data store. So we're going to focus on the atmosphere data store because all the data that we're going to use in this tutorial comes from here. And this is a very nice um, resource because it includes a lot of very good data uh, from the past, uh, the present and the future um, on atmospheric composition. And you can access this data either on the website or programmatically. And we're going to see how to do that. So if you click on the link to enter into the Atmosphere Data Store. So this is the page that you see to begin with. Um, 
and you'll see that it's possible to enter a, a keyword search. So if you if you know what you're looking for, you can already enter some text in here and then search. Or if you just want to see the entire offering, then you can click on search and you'll find everything. So all of the data sets are listed here. And when you when you go to a data set, so for example, if we go to the um, if we go to the CAMS Global Atmospheric Composition Forecasts, then you can find more information about the data. So here you find an overview of the data set. And you also find a, um, a tab here to actually download the data. So here you can specify exactly what variables, what uh, time period um, or geographical coverage um, and all the various settings you can, you can choose them here. And then you can download the data either by selecting this link here so this will download it directly. Um, and you'll see a little uh, uh, icon here. And you just click on that icon, and it'll download the data directly. Or you can download it programmatically using the API. And to do that, you would select Show API Request. And here you get a block of code, which you can just copy and paste. So you can copy and paste this block of code into um, a Python script, and you can download it by running this script. Why is this useful? So this is useful because you can change any of the parameters here. So if you want to loop through different uh, lead time hours or different different dates or different variables, you can do that um, within this script. Now, in order to use the, the API, you need to um, you need to get an API. You need to uh, get an an API key. And if you click on this documentation page, it will show you how to do that. Also, in the Jupyter notebook, um, there's a link to um, to obtain an an, uh, an API key, which is is actually down here. Okay, I forgot to mention that to enter into the atmosphere data store, you first need to log in or register. And this is a very simple registration. So for me, I, I was able to access uh, by default because I'm already registered. But if you're not registered, then all you need to do is select this link here to, to register. And it's a very simple registration process. So once you have registered with the Atmosphere Data Store, and once you have obtained an API key, then you can begin to use the um, you can be, you can begin to use the API to download the data programmatically. And now we're going to see how to do that. So first of all, we need to select our data. Um, but I just want to show you here that when once you have once you have obtained your um, user ID and API key, um, there's a, a, a code block here where you can insert this. You you replace this text with your user ID and API key, and then if you run this um, this code block, then uh, it will save you will save it in this variable, which is useful for later on in the script. I won't do it now because I've already um, I've already uh, created this variable with my own um, user ID and, and API key. So to begin with the um, uh, with this particular script um, showing you how to um, download the data programmatically. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to import various libraries. So you need to import the, the, the CDS API um, library. Um, 
And this you can install, uh, you can either install using uh, pip install. So here there's uh, pip install CDS API. Um, of course, if you're running this Jupyter notebook using the, the, the binder link, then this has already been done for you because it's part of the environment um, that's already set up. But if you're doing this uh, on your own system, then you need to install the CDS API. So it's just a very simple pip install CDS API. We're also going to um, import various other libraries. So we're going to import uh, NumPy and XArray. So XArray is a very useful array-based um, library for working with uh, multi-dimensional arrays, such as NetCDF files. Uh, and we're actually going to download the data in NetCDF format. So XArray is very good at reading and handling NetCDF files. We're also going to import some libraries for plotting and visualizing the data. So matplotlib and cartopy. And then a few libraries um, for extracting uh, the file, the files in zip format, which will be downloaded in um, as zip files. And also some libraries for, um, for, for viewing animations. So we're going to run this um, cell block here to, uh, to import these libraries. We're also going to create a data directory for the data that we will download. So uh, we're going to create a, a, a data directory called um, in, the, in the current working directory called forward slash data. And now we can, we can choose the data that we're going to download. So to do this, we're going to go back into the Atmosphere Data Store, and we're going to download some data from the CAMS Global Atmospheric Composition Forecasts. And these are the parameters that we're going to download. Okay, so um, this shows you the, the variables, um, the date range, uh, the area, um, and the format of the data that we're, that we're going to uh, work with. And as I mentioned before, in the if we go in, now go into the, the, the catalog, the atmosphere data store, I think I've already got it open here. Let me just close these other tabs. So here's the atmosphere data store. Okay. Again, we go into the atmosphere data store, we can select data sets, and we scroll down to the global, the CAMS global atmospheric composition forecasts. So CAMS produces uh, this data, um, produces forecasts for atmospheric composition twice a day. And this includes many different chemical species and types of aerosols, and also some meteorological variables. And the initial conditions of the forecast are obtained by combining the previous forecast with current satellite observations. And this is called data, data simulation. And this data simulation produces the best estimate of the of the state of the atmosphere um, at the initial forecast time step. So this is called analysis. So basically, we're combining um, previous forecast with, with with the current observations as a basis for um, for, for for the forecast. Um, then the forecast itself uses a model of the atmosphere based on the laws of physics and chemistry. To determine the evolution of um, of all the various different species and parameters um, for the next five days. Now, what you can also do is you can do you don't have to do a forecast based on the last available analysis, but you can also go back in time, and that's what we're going to do because we're going to look at a particular event at the beginning of August in um, the United States. So we're going to look at some of the wildfire activity, and we're going to create a forecast from a time step in the beginning of August this year. Um, and we're going to look at the, uh, how the um, uh, one particular variable um, has spread over the country and affected air quality um, over, the, over some parts of the United States. So we're going to 
um, we, we, we're going to select, um, okay, sorry, in this overview section, you can see also a lot of information about the, the different variables and the resolution, the, 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 the vertical resolution, the horizontal resolution, um, and the temporal resolution, and all of the, and the characteristics of all the different variables um, in the data set. So here you can see a list of all the variables, uh, so the different uh, chemical species, the different aerosols, and the different meteorological variables. And you can also see their, uh, their units here. So this provides you information about the data set. If you want more detailed information, you can go to the documentation. And here you can find um, more detailed uh, information about the product. So then to actually obtain the data, we go to the download data tab. And here you find all of the, um, you can select all of the, 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 the parameters for the download. And in this particular case, we're going to select organic matter aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers. So to, to select or deselect, you can, you can select all the variables or you can, you can just select individually whichever variables you're interested in. So we're going to focus only on organic matter aerosol optical depth. Then, um, okay, these are the single level variables. There's also multi-level variables. If you're interested in multiple levels, um, you can select them here. Um, so when you select multi-level variables, you can select the different levels. So by levels, we're talking about pressure levels in the atmosphere. So basically different heights in the atmosphere um, from one hectopascal to 1,000 hectopascals. So if you're selecting multi-level variables, you can also select the pressure level here. But we're going to focus on single level, uh, a single level parameter. So, um, so all the pressure levels will be grayed out. Then um, we can select the date range, and we're actually going to uh, create a forecast from different analysis time steps every day. Uh, from the 1st to the 8th of August. And the analysis, so the, the first step of the forecast will be zero, but you can choose zero or 12. And then we're going to choose a lead time, different lead times from zero, six, 12, and 18 hours from the initial um, analysis. So basically four steps um, for each of the days um, from the 1st to the 8th of August. Then here we can also select a, um, we can select the, the, the whole area or we can select a subset. And we're going to select a subset over um, North America. So this is from um, 25 to 80 degrees latitude and minus 50, minus 150 to minus 50 longitude. And we're going to select the, to download the data in NetCDF format. So now all we need to do is we need to select the API request and we can copy this code block. Okay, we've already imported the CDS API. Um, and also we've already uh, run this line here. So all we need is this code block to download the data. Okay, so if we copy that, and we can paste it into this, into this block here, okay? And once we've done that, we, we only need to run this, um, this block to then download the data. So if we run this, um, it downloads the data. The data is very small, so it should download very fast. Um, just something to point out, I'm just going back to the catalog, because something to point out is that some data um, is very fast because it's on disk. Other data uh, can be quite slow to download um, if it's on uh, tapes. And there's, I think this is explained here, so fast versus slow data. But any data that's on tape will be, will be uh, flagged. So you'll know if it's uh, very slow, if, if it's going to take a long time to download, 
um, there's actually a section here on slow um, not here but it'll it'll be specified where um, the data is uh, is on tape instead of on disk so this particular data is on is on disk so it's very fast to um, to download then once we've downloaded it then we can extract it um, so we'll it'll be downloaded in in zip format so we run this code block here to extract the data then we can um, so this uh, the, the, this line of code is just to create a variable out of the file name so the file name uh, in the, the, the extracted data which you can see is in netcdf format so um, we're going to put this file name into um, a variable called fn and then we can open this netcdf data in x-array so we create an x-array data set okay so this is this line of code here is just to create um, uh, a, a data set um, in x-ray so um, this we can now have a look at and here you see the structure of the uh, of the data so you can see that there are various coordinates um, longitude latitude and time so the time this includes the um, the different uh, lead times of 0, 6, 12, and 18 hours from each of the analysis time steps for, for every day from the 1st to the 8th of August. We can also see um, the actual variable. So this is a variable. Um, and if we click on this icon here, we can um, see the, the, the so this variable is organic matter aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers um, now if we want to start working with this data normally in x-ray uh, you convert from so a data set an x-ray data set contains everything that was in the net cdf file but then if you want to uh, work with one particular variable which in this case is this uh, organic matter aerosol opt optical depth, you convert it into a data array, which includes only that variable. Even if the data set only contains one variable, in any case, we're going to create a data array from that data set of this variable. Um, for more information about X-Array, there's very good tutorials um, that explain uh, you know the concepts and the difference between data arrays and and uh, data sets but here we're just going to create a data array from this variable and so we run that um, we, we run that line of code and then we can view the data array which looks very much the same as the data set given that we only have one um, variable here and then finally we can we can create an animation of this uh, data throughout the different time steps. So for each of the time steps of each of the days um, from the 1st to the 8th of August. And we can do that with this code block here. So um, this is just the, the code block to create the animation. So it's based on matplotlib. Um, you create a figure, you define the various different axes. Um, and then you do this in a loop in order to create the animation. So if we run this, here we can see the animation of the organic matter aerosol optical depth. And interesting, what we, the interesting um, thing about this animation is you can really see how the, uh, the, the, organic, the organic matter um, aerosol optical depth is, is going across from, um, from the west coast uh, to the east coast. And the, um, the, the source um, is really uh, is mainly from these, um, these wildfires in California. 
in particular, there was one particularly big fire, which is the Dixie Fire, uh, which by the 6th of August had grown to become the largest single wildfire in the history of California. So um, it was a huge uh, event. And you can really see how the uh, organic matter um, from this um, went right across the country from, from coast to coast, and it even affected the air quality um, on the east coast of North America. So it's a, it was a really big event. Um, so this is, uh, this, this is just a very quick uh, overview of how you can download and visualize um, some of this data. If you want to look at historical data, um, so this is the forecast data, but if you want to, if you want to really look at um, uh, a long time series of historical data, it's better to look at the reanalysis data. So the reanalysis data provides a, um, a, a consistent uh, time series of uh, data um, from 2003 uh, to present, to the present. Um, and what we're going to do now in this last part of the tutorial is to look at this reanalysis data. So we're going to go back to the, uh, the catalog and we're going to choose, we, we're going to um, download some of the um, CAMS global reanalysis data um, using these parameters here. So this is the, um, the block of code from the API request. And it shows you exactly the parameters that we're going to focus on. So here we're back in the catalog. And we go back to data sets. And this time we're going to look at the CAMS global reanalysis monthly average fields. So if we select this data set. So, um, here we can see again the characteristics of this data. So we see the, the, the resolution, uh, the temporal coverage, and so on. So, um, so here you can see um, all of the, uh, the, different, the different variables contained in this data set. And this is good if you want to look at a, a long you know, time series of historical data, because with the, the forecast data, um, it changes every time there's an improved uh, model, whereas this is a consistent uh, time series. So you can really um, look at data um, in, in, in a consistent way, knowing that it, that, that it stays the same throughout the, or the characteristics of the data will be the same throughout the, um, uh, the, throughout the, whole, cover, the, the te whole temporal coverage. So now we're going to go to the download data tab to choose our parameters. And this time we're going to look at carbon monoxide. Um, and this time we're also going to look at different pressure levels. So we're not going to just focus on one single level, but we're going to look at the, difference, the differences throughout different um, heights of the atmosphere. And we're, we're, going, to, um, we're going to look at um, from 100 hectopascals to 1,000. Um, and we're just going to focus on August 2020. Okay, so remember, if you want to change any of these parameters, um, you can either select them all, or you can, you can select only you know, individual months. So here we're just going to look at one month. We're going to look at the monthly mean. And we're also going to look at the full area. In actual fact, we're going to look at only the northern hemisphere. But I'll show you how in X-ray you can uh, filter the data to include only um, one, geogra one geographical area. So we're going to download everything, but we're then we're going to do a filtering in, um, in X-ray. Um, in any case, the data is quite small. So um, it's only a few megabytes. And again, we're going to choose NetCDF format. So here we can, if we select the submit form, we download the data directly in, um, in the web interface. But if we want to, um, to download the data within the Jupyter Notebook, 
then we click on show API request and we take this code here. Okay. So this is the same code that's in this code block. So then if we run this, we'll be able to download the data. And again, we can um, extract it in the usual way. Um, and then we can open it, we can read it into X-Array. And we can view the different um, the characteristics of this data so we can see the, the, the coordinates. Um, and this time, instead of just longitude and latitude and time, we also have the level. So the, these are the different pressure levels. And here we can see all the different pressure levels. Um, then again, we to convert this from a data set to a data array. So we run this code block here to do that. And now we're going to uh, instead of viewing an animation, we're going to view a meridional, a meridional mean plot. So this will allow us to um, to view the view the data in the different different pressure levels. So that, so we'll see a profile at different heights uh, of the carbon monoxide. And but we'll we're going to in order to be able to see this in a two dimensional uh, plot, um, we're going to average over the latitudinal axis. So we're going to only focus on the northern hemisphere and we're going to look at different longitudes um, in the northern hemisphere, but we're averaging over the latitudes. So basically we're averaging, we, we're looking at all of the, we're averaging all of the latitudes from zero to 90 uh, degrees north. So to do that, we, um, here there's a simple, uh, um, um, line of code here where we use um, the where function here to um, to average over the different over all the latitudes uh, above uh, latitude zero um, and then we take the mean uh, so first of all we filter out uh, the latitudes that are, that are, that are um, less than zero and then we take the mean um, of each latitude And now we can plot the data. Um, we can plot a meridional mean plot. And um, so this is this is the code to create the figure. Um, here we just define the figure. We define the axes. Um, so the, by axes I mean the the kind of area in the figure where the actual plot um, will be. And then we can set the various tick marks and the labels. And the title um, and also the color bar. Um, so if you run this, then here we have the figure. And what we can see here is we can see the the, the longitudes. Um, so all the all the longitudes. Um, and and on the um, on the y-axis, we can see the different pressure levels from the surface uh, up into uh, up up to 100. Um, millibars. Um, so what we're seeing here is the different concentrations of carbon monoxide at different levels of the atmosphere for different longitudes. And often you can see a different concentration of um, carbon monoxide at, at different um, at, at different um, heights as it's transported across, um, even if the source may have been uh, elsewhere. So this was just a very simple um, demonstration of how you can access and visualize data from CAMS. Um, so I would finish here, but I would I would just include maybe one more thing in this uh, in this th this last block of code is just a um, uh, is just a, an optional code to to create a custom color map similar to that used in CAMS products. So if we run this, okay, we create a color map, which is called CAMS color map here. And we'll copy that. And if we go up to the first figure, so this figure here. So this figure was created using one of the default uh, matplotlib 
color maps. So this is yellow, orange, red. Okay, but if we replace this with the, the, cast, the custom color map we created and we rerun this uh, block of code, then you'll see the animation using uh, the CAMS, the, the typical CAMS color map, which you'll see on uh, some of the products on the website. So I think I'll finish here. I just want to remind you that if you want to um, run this tutorial at home, then you can you just go into the GitHub repository, the Copernicus training. Um, so it's um, ECMWF projects, Copernicus training, GitHub repository, and you'll find uh, the notebook material there. So you can either download the notebook itself if you want to install um, Python and Jupyter and all the various libraries in your own system, or you can just uh, run the binder link here and you can run it within a container online without having to install anything. So I think I will finish there. And thank you very much for watching. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and um, look forward to any questions. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so we have the document with the question and answers on the screen now. Um, we'll go through them one by one and, and answer where we can. And if we can't answer right now, um, the, they will be answered at some point in the next couple of days and, and included in this document. So if we start with the first question, um, can we convert aerosol optical depth to the mass concentration? Uh, well, um, it's a difficult one to answer. So in the CAMS products, the uh, mass concentrations for all the aerosol species are included, so you can access them individually. Um, but of course, we are um, estimating the mass concentration based on the AOD. But rather than go through that process, it's better to maybe just download the um, the the mass concentration fields and, and use those directly. Okay, so I'll move on to question two. Um, is it possible to run the model online at Eastern Dulliff website and acquire results to plot with other GIFs software? Um, short answer is no. Um, so basically we're running the model um, operationally. So we provide two forecasts a day and these are initialized at midnight and midday uh, universal time. Um, uh, but at some point, there will be the possibility through the atmosphere data store, a toolbox will be developed and available in which you'll be able to do that kind of plot, at least you'll be able to plot the data how you want via this uh, toolbox on the website. And also, as Chris has just shown, um, you can take the data from the ADS and, and plot them with your own software. Chris has shown Jupyter Notebooks, but it, in principle, you can do it with any software. Okay, so question three, how do CAMS reanalysis data sim simulate secondary organic aerosols? Um, all right, okay, this is quite a technical question and I think one that's probably best to be answered offline. I don't have the information off the top of my head, but um, it is documented. Okay, so question four, what is the difference between GMAO and CAMS? Is there any connection between them? Well. Um, so GMO, GMAO and CAMS are two separate organizations and um, institutes. Um, so GMAO is part of NASA, CAMS is part of the European Copernicus program um, and is implemented at ECMWF. There are no direct connections between them in terms of the models that are used, which are both different systems. Uh, there'll be some similarities in the observations which are used between the two systems, but but that's but that's it. There's there's no other connection. Okay, so question five: Is it possible to apply CAMS models to a specific location area within situ measurements as input, or is it too complex when applied to a small area? Okay, so we kind of do this in CAMS already. So as I explained, we have we're running the global system at ECMWF, but we're also running a European air quality system with 
I think I said nine models, but I think now it's actually 11. Um, and those essentially do this. So they take the boundary conditions from the global fo forecast, um, and then they use in situ measurements in their assimilation. Um, so in principle, you could do this with any other regional model or limited area model. Um, and yeah, the data, you can contact our user support to, to get help with how you can um, access the data to do this. Okay, so question six, um, how can we use in situ or other satellite measurements to fill Sentinel 5P? Um, well, I would argue based on what I've presented today that, I mean, there's, there's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that because you're talking about gaps, not just in space, but also in time. A lot of the satellites are in polar orbit, so they're all measuring at slightly different times, but you don't really get full filling in of the gaps of, of, of a particular instrument. The best way to do this is to use a model framework like I've shown today and like we're showing the other day uh, by Melanie and assimilate all these different data sets and then let the model fill in fill in the gaps because you're still at the mercy of there being gaps in the other measurements if you see what i mean so. okay great thanks and question seven the end of the website what's the difference between cams near real time and cams reanalysis data uh, they're not quite the same so the um the cams near real time data is based on the the current version of the model system um but that model system gets updated every so often so there you do get jumps then in the outputs every every so often when we upgrade and, and improve the model the reanalysis is one one consistent model version that provides the full period so then you can compare this year with 2003 and all the years in between whereas in the operational near real time product you can't really do that but the near real time is what's produced in the two daily forecasts and is what what is available to give you the most uh, up-to-date information on atmospheric composition. Okay, so this is uh, one of the big questions in, in our field. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe better to, to skip it. Uh, the, the interactions are very complex. So climate change, changing the atmospheric temperature, the circulation patterns, those can affect air quality in terms of the emissions and their distribution. Um, but this is really up a, you know, this is really big research question, and there's uh, hundreds and thousands of papers being being um, that have been published on this. Okay, so question now: What are the main differences in the secondary organic aerosol scheme by Marin Two and CAMS? And I think this is again, I don't have the information to hand, and it's something we can um, provide offline. Okay, so question 10, how accurate the data will come in comparison to ground level monitoring of pollutants? Um, so I'm presuming this is meaning the accuracy of the, the CAMS forecasts. Um, well, like I explained, we have a periodic um, validation of our um, outputs against ground level monitoring um, observations. And so all of that information is documented and available through our website as, as i explained so i think you can find the slide to, and find the link to where, where that information is okay so cams global atmospheric composition forecast and cams global reanalysis are the same which probably all right um, and again this is similar to the answer i gave a couple of questions ago okay so so um Excuse me, just uh, losing my place. Um, okay, so it's similar to the answer I gave uh, a few questions ago. Um, it's just differences in in the near real time is um, more up to date, and then the reanalysis is uh, this consistent data set that, that covers a longer period of time. So for conducting a validation study, then it depends on the time frame you're interested in. If you're interested in comparing two different years, then the reanalysis would be better, uh, but for particular case studies, um, the near real time, but it would be interesting to compare both as well, I think. Oh, 
Okay, so I'm gonna move on. So I'm being told to read the questions um, out loud. So question 12, so just let um, the writing finish. Okay, so question 12, how are the PM 2.5 and PM 10 values estimated in ECN WF CAMS global data set? What satellite data is used for validation? Is it true that modal forecast data is assimilated every few days or for more, for more accuracy? And what is the methodology for forecasting? Um, okay, it's a lot of questions in one. Um, all the information on how we calculate the surface PM 2.5 and PM 10 concentrations is um, available in, in our, um, we have a user forum and knowledge base uh, accessible through our website, which contains the formulae which are used for, for calculating these things. Um, and as for the other questions, I think, uh, again, these are things that were addressed um, in the lecture today and uh, in the lecture the other day. Um, but if there are more specific questions, then we'll be able to answer those at another time. But maybe it's worth adding in terms of what satellite data is used for validation. Well, um, there are products which derive surface PM concentrations from satellites, um, but they're still based on some of the aerosol optical depth observations which are assimilated. So it would be very, very difficult then to, to do that kind of validation better in, in this case to use whatever ground-based measurements are available for validation of, of surface PM. Okay, so question 13. For the case of biomass burning and the comparison of the aerosol optical depth, satellite data and PM 2.5 from CAMS between the biomass burning period and non-biomass burning period at a specific region, what would be the reason for no observed changes in aerosol optical depth, but observed increase in PM 2.5 for the same year, for example? Um, this is quite a big question as well. Uh, but what I would say is that in cases where you see increases in uh, PM 2.5, but not necessarily in aerosol optical depth, could just indicate that uh, fire is not, the smoke from the fire is not really getting out of the boundary layer and so it might not contribute to the observed aerosol optical depth. But because we have the observed source of the fires and the estimated emissions, we, we still have some element of PM 2.5 or, or other uh, pollutants. Okay, so I'll move on to question 14. Can you export the animation? Can we save the figure after plotting it be using Jupyter? Um, I think this is true, this is the case, but if Chris is online, maybe he can answer this one. Yep. Um, so the, the answer is uh, you can definitely um, save the figure after plotting it. Um, and you can also export the animation. I'm not sure, I don't think in this particular script, let me just have a quick look because I'm not sure if that was actually included in the script. Um, no, for the animation, no, ah, yeah, because the animation in this case was just looping through the different, so rewriting the figure. So um, in this case, um, there wasn't the option to save it, but there are other ways you can create an animation and you can create a movie file, which you can then keep and download. Um, for the other figure as well, yeah, sorry, I didn't include a line to save the figure, but it's, it's just one line of, of code to, to, to save the, the figures of PNG or JPEG or whatever you want to um, save it in. So, so that can be done. Um, if you know, you can even just, or you can look at some of the other Jupyter notebooks, or you can just Google, you know, how to save a figure, and and and, and it's a very simple thing to do in, um, uh, yeah, in Python. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so just let, okay, so we'll move on to question 15, uh, which is model performance wise, NASA GEOS versus ECMWF CAMS. Uh, well, both uh, systems have um, their advantages and, and disadvantages. Um, I'm gonna be diplomatic in answering this, um, but I think I think one thing right now where, where CAMS maybe does have an advantage is we assimilate more satellite observations, but I know that NASA is working on um, the assimilation of other species in their system. And so 
um, they should become more comparable and it's good to have different systems that do similar things so we can better understand then the processes in the models and understand atmospheric composition. I think it's only so, fair that Mel and Neil Pavan have a chance to answer as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's also important to note that GIOS is a research model. It research is its primary focus. It's it's not an operational model. Um, so that's uh, I guess one factor that anybody using the output should take into consideration. Yeah, uh, this is Paul, and I just want to add one more thing. Actually, uh, it really depends on what specific uh, application or science question you are trying to address. Um, and each of these models has capabilities uh, to address certain things in different ways. So I would not generalize them uh, uh, in terms of whether one is better or other. It really depends on your application, what you're trying to do, and based on your application, you can choose one or on another. Okay, great. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Pavan. Yeah. So I think we'll move on to question 16, uh, which is without using Jupyter Notebook, can we directly download data with an animation of specific dates, like you can in the NASA portal web tool, Giovanni? Um, so I would say, yes, you can download the data directly um, from the Atmosphere Data Store and use whatever application you want to, to produce a map. Uh, one tool that's also quite useful that was developed by NASA is called Panaply. Um, and this is a, a, a little application which into which you can feed uh, NetCDF data and produce maps uh, very quickly. Um, and without needing to know any codes, but it's it's very good for a quick looks at data. But if you then want to do more data analysis, you need to use something like Python or um, a programming language. Okay, so question 17, is CAMS reanalysis data going to be available on Google Earth Engine? Um, I'm not completely up to date with what is available on Google Earth Engine. I know that some people have been um, putting some of our data on there, but um, right now I'm not sure off the top of my head um, what information there is there, but in principle, um, it could be added. Um, but we'd have, to, we'd have to look into it. Okay, question 18. Are these data on ECMWF website available for Africa? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, this is global data, and so the, everything's there for, for Africa as well. Um, so in our global products, for sure, but I would also add that our European regional domain also includes uh, a reasonably large area of North Africa around the Mediterranean. Okay, so question 19, how do you validate organic and black carbon aerosols? What are the main points that need to be studied in the near future for accurate estimation of black carbon and organic carbon? Okay, so um, some element of this is done in our validation reports, although um, not so extensively, just because the data is not all, the validation data is not always available in near real time. Um, but um, what we need to, to do in, in the near future to, under, to better or to improve the modeling of these, um, of these aerosols is it, it all comes down to the emissions. Are the anthropogenic emissions right? Are the fire emissions right? Um, as well as then how that translates into things like PM10, PM2.5. Often in these cases, we're relying on measurement campaign data that will make then specific measurements or, or particular processes. Um, but I'm not aware off the top of my head if, if anything is there in the literature right now.
I just want to add something for question 17 for the Google Earth Engine. I don't think CAM's reanalysis data is on Google Earth Engine right now. You can find, for example, um, the Copernicus Climate Change Service reanalysis data, the ERA 5, that's on there. Um, but not yet the, the camp one. I don't know if there are any plans to um, to put it on. Uh, sorry, it's ERA 5, E-R-A. Yeah, correct. And that's from the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Okay, thanks, Chris. So we're down to question 20. What does the term single level refer to? Does it stand for the surface? Okay, so on the atmosphere data store, uh, as Chris explained, there's the three-dimensional data on model levels and pressure levels, um, and the single level data essentially refers to all of the two-dimensional products, so those that only have a, a latitude and longitude dimension. So it would be surface concentrations of particulate matter, but also all the aerosol optical depth values for the different aerosol species are also referred to as single level because those are also 2D, 2D, um, 2D data. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so question 21, which data can be used to assess carbon dioxide sequestration, such as from urban vegetation in relation to air pollution in urban area? Um, I don't think I, I can answer this right now. It's something we'll have to look into. We do have carbon dioxide forecasts and we do have a greenhouse gas reanalysis, but if but I'm not sure that that data is at a sufficiently high resolution or if the processes in our model are enough to to fully um, assess uh, things like things related to CO2 sequestration. We are running biosphere models and there are developments to include urban vegetation and urban tiles within the, the model, but um, I'm not sure the states of that we can look into it. Okay, so that looks like it's the last question. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for th to those people who had the questions, very, very interesting um, and very good questions, and I hope we've answered them and more answers will, will come in the coming days. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chris, for excellent presentations and going through the, all the exercise for downloading and accessing CAMS data. And uh, we had really good question answer session. So, uh, question answers script sh scripts from all three sessions will be posted um, on website for people who want to refer them along with the recordings. Uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, I want to uh, probably Brock can mention. Brock, can you comment on the certificate and homeworks? What 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 to expect for the participants? Uh, yeah, basically, um, if you're looking for a certificate of completion, um, you had to have attended uh, all three parts and complete the homework assignment, which is on the training web page under part three right now. We just made that available. Um, that is due by October 14th, and uh, it's a Google form. So um, you'll find it there. And if you have all four of those check boxes, you will get a certificate uh, emailed to you as a PDF attachment um, within about three months. We have a lot of people attending the training. It takes a little bit of time to process attendance and, and everything. Great, thanks, Brock. Uh, so I just want to finally thanks everyone. Uh, Brock, uh, Shelvin, Jonathan, they all helped really put together this training. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Melanie and Mark and Chris uh, for putting excellent presentations. I hope everybody was able to learn something. And like I said, all the materials, PPT, recording, script, question answer scripts, all are available. Uh, you will receive an email from Brock about uh, filling in survey. Uh, surveys are very, very critical for us to receive your feedback and improve on training and design new trainings for the topics which you may like to uh, see us doing training. So please take a few minutes and uh, fill out those surveys when it comes your way through email. Um, and 
always looking forward for more trainings in the future thank you everyone have good good day bye bye thanks a lot thanks everyone bye bye